Hello, everybody. I hope everyone's finding themselves safe and healthy during this time. I wanted to let you know a few things before we get to today's episode. Um, we recorded this over Memorial Day weekend, so in the beginning we talk about a three-day weekend, um, so just disregard that. Um, this episode's all about language. Oh my gosh, we had so much fun. I mean, Jamie and I are both English majors, so we just we had a great time talking about how language, literature, reading, and all of that is incorporated into the Montessori classroom. It is such a rich part of the classroom, and oh my gosh, we had so much fun talking about it. Um, I wanted to let you guys know that we are now on YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, um, and I've been putting our recent episodes on YouTube. So it's just another way for you to listen. Um, I will include that link at the bottom of this episode. Um, also, if you haven't subscribed on our website yet, please do. We are so pumped to start sharing things with you. Um, so go ahead and check that out, um, allthingsmontessoripodcast.com. And as always, if you have any questions or just want to reach out or, or anything, please email us. We love hearing from you and, and um, we love having the space to, to connect with all of you. All right, so I hope you enjoy this episode. Hello, Jamie. Happy weekend. How are you? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm good. Um, yeah, I'm good. It's a three-day weekend, you know, which mm-hmm. is sort of weird when, like, you know, <laughs> I feel like there's no semblance of when time. Not, yeah. <laughs> when you're not going to work anyway. I know. It's, at it's, work. Right. I know. I know, but I don't know. I think it, you and I have talked about this a little bit, like, working from home, you know, the work is always just it's there you know so it's Mm -hmm. you know you have to find those those balance that balance and you know I find that I've been working just the amount the same amount if not more you know with being at home yeah which is wild yeah yeah well it's there and there's nobody to like go have a long lunch with right right exactly it's so mm -hmm. I find myself like eating quickly and Mm -hmm. heading back to work and Mm -hmm. yeah I know. It's so bizarre how that happens. But anyway, um, yeah, I'm doing good. I'm excited to talk about um, language and everything that goes along with it today. The language uh, section of the classroom was always one of my favorites. I mean, I was an English major, so, you know, I was naturally (laughs) naturally drawn to that. Um, But yeah, I'm excited to talk about it today. Me too. When I when I think about like the language work we do with the children, both in in primary and elementary, you know, the main goals are really to help the children become strong and effective communicators. And that's both in spoken uh, communication that they become able to know that they have something to say and they can say it as, um, you know, orally. And that they know how to mm-hmm. listen, but also in writing, that they have something to say and they can write it. And they have a skill then in reading the words of others and interpreting that. And at the heart of what we do in um, in language with the children are those goals. Like that's what we're trying to help them develop as a, as a you know, a real strong skill in being able to communicate and being able to, you know, read and hear the words of others. Yeah, I mean, and that to me, I mean, that's the whole point of language, isn't it? Like, right. <laughs> to communicate and ex- right to express what you your thoughts to effectively communicate to understand language and and all of that. Um, yeah, that's that's the whole point. Um, and I I think it's so wonderful how language sort of is filtered all over the classroom. You know, just by you know all the stories that the guides tell the class um you know the passion and your voice when you're telling one of those great stories or maybe it's just a history story or or anything like that um you know the children are going to pick up on that and think wow stories are really interesting or or, you know and then they can be inspired to either read their own story or write their own story you know it all kind of is connected yep 
Well, and we have to remember, like, communication's a human tendency. Like, all humans are driven to communicate with one another. We had to to survive, and we have to to take care of children and work together. And so communication is something we're all driven to do, and this is true of children as well. And as we as we consider how we support that communication, we have to think about it as that, you know, they're driven to do it anyway, and they're building mm-hmm. themselves that way. And so what our job is, is to really just help to support and scaffold that as they develop it. You know, and we talked about with um, Alice and Oz, whenever that was, a month or two ago, <laughs> um, yeah, how reading is not easy for our brains. Like that's not actually Mm -hmm. something our brains naturally do very well. It's a very difficult skill to acquire. So as we consider the reading aspect of language, you know, we have to re we have to remember that it's, it doesn't come, you know, when we watch children like uh, learn to talk, it seems almost effortless, right? They just take in language and, and they start to speak and they add more and more vocabulary, you know, every day and um Mm -hmm. but reading reading isn't as effortless so (laughs) no it's really it's really not and and I think learning to read takes a great amount of patience um for the child and also for anybody helping Mm -hmm. the child because um it takes so long and it's, it's such an emotional experience um I think you know reading aloud in general I mean I was a good reader but that that scared me too. I mean, it's, you feel really vulnerable. Um, there's a lot of things to think about and, and, uh, you know, your, your brain can kind of, you know, mess that up for you. Even if you are reading aloud, maybe you feel nervous and then you mess up on a word and then, you know, that could be traumatic. We have to always remember with the children that they, um, they're going to read aloud at least one grade level below what their silent reading level is. If not, Mm -hmm. if not more, Mm -hmm. um, Mm. And and to be honest, I mean, there are a lot of adults who can't read out loud very effectively, um, but yeah. particularly with the children, we do have to we do have to remember that. Now, if they if they learn to write, learn their sounds, learn to write and suddenly discover they can read in the in the children's house in primary, um, it, it is a lot it, it is because they have the absorbent mind at that time, it does it does seem like an explosion. It does just emerge more than, Mm -hmm. but if Mm -hmm. they come into the elementary not reading, uh, which is fine, it is going to just take a lot more sort of uh, focus and effort than it, than it did, than it would in the, in the children's house because they have to consciously put some energy toward it. Yeah. And I mean, and, and they don't, I mean, a six-year-old or a seven-year-old is pretty, they're still pretty unaware um, of a lot of things. Um, so they're not, maybe at first they won't kind of realize, oh, I can't read and everybody else can, you know, um, because mm-hmm. they're one of my favorite things about the Montessori classroom in lower elementary. Um, you know, there's so many things for the children to do if they cannot read, which is great. Right. I mean, it's definitely, right. you want to get them reading as soon as you can, because then it's like the classroom will kind of open itself up to them and they'll be able to really delve into the elementary work. But there are so many great opportunities. And, um, you know, when they're six years old, they're still kind of, they're, they're definitely entering the second plane of development, but, you know, they still are, you know, they're still coming out of children's house, right? So you can always you know, you can bring those materials in if you have to do some sort of, you know, work with them. I mean, the best thing you want to do with those sort of reading lessons, Jamie, you always said to just keep them fun and short and consistent. Yeah. So do them all the time, but make them really, really fun. (laughs) Yeah. 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 So I've been thinking a lot about children who haven't, you know, had uh, haven't been in school every day. And now, you know, we're all looking toward a summer uh, without even yeah. the, the distance learning that's been going on. And mm-hmm. and I think particularly those emerging readers that maybe aren't reading super fluently yet, how to, how to help them and also just all the children. Um, and I think reading's a big, reading's one that can happen at home. And, you know, because you can have, you can have some books and you can read with the child. And I think things to really consider for both guides and parents and caregivers 
um, is that when a child's struggling with a skill, we don't want to focus on that skill to the exclusion of everything else. Because Mm -hmm. as you were saying, like they start to realize that the rest of the class or other people do know how to read and they, and they start to feel a sense of, you know, uh, inadequacy. Mm -hmm. And we don't want then their only engagement in, you know, with, with work to be related to that one thing they feel really like they're inadequate. And so that's the, that's the reason to have short and fun little activities and lessons on, on um, practicing reading skills when you're, and that can be, um, you know, we talked about the sound game Mm -hmm. uh, with Allison too. That can be doing some sound game things that could be labeling different things in our environment. It could be writing your own language experience book. So like a shared event that you might write down, you know, have the child tell you what, what they want to say, you write it down and then you read it together Mm -hmm. because the Mm -hmm. child then knows what those words are because they've thought of them. And um, So, I mean, there's all sorts of little things we can do that can be fun and fast and, um, and then leave the child sort of wanting more. One Um, thing I did with writing, um, I just incorporated it into art. Um, and I found that that worked really well. Um, so we do, um, like illuminated letters or just make, or just pick one letter and then, you know, color it in or or make it beautiful and make it, you know, they could make it really big or really small. I found that that was, that always really worked. Um, cause you know, yeah. Exciting things that are fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. They, you know, giving them, um, a magazine or a newspaper that, that they can just go through and pick out all of the words they know and cut them out and make mm-hmm. a big collage. I mean, mm-hmm. anything that gets them excited about language. And and that also means not only do we want to, you know, help have them engaged in that w- in some activities, but we also just want to give them a lot of language experiences. So they should, um, you know, they should be listening to someone read daily. Mm-hmm. whether it's whether the adults in the home can read whether the you can get um get some books you know that they can listen to some audio books i think audible for a while was doing free children's books available at the beginning of all this i'm, mm-hmm. I'm not sure if that's continued um but those kinds of things are really really important for them to get a lot of exposure to language I had one little guy, maybe my first or second year of teaching, um, uh, and it was a six to twelve class. And this six year old, um, the the mom told the story to me. He went home and said we were reading. I was reading The Hobbit out loud, which the mom thought that's like way beyond a six year old's ability. So she said, "Well, do you understand the book?" And the sweet little boy said, "Well." I don't always understand what what's happening, but I love the sound of the words. Oh, how sweet. Right? Yeah. That's and amazing. that's the thing. Like, mm-hmm. we want the children to hear all sorts of kinds of words uh, mm-hmm. and how they sound together and the flow of the words. Mm-hmm. And that's what reading um, books that are well beyond their grade level to them helps them to just develop that under, you know, sort of that sensorial understanding of syntax and, and, and diction and all of it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And that's going to make them, you know, we're, they're going to work on their listening while you, while they're listening to you reading. And then it's going to help them when they're on the other side of that, right. When, you know, listening to someone read aloud, that's sort of preparing them for public speaking in a way, right? Because they're they're understanding exactly what you were saying, the flow of the words, you know, if you, there are any inflections, like how you're putting excitement into your voice, you know, all of those things. Um, and I find that reading aloud to children is one of the most sacred things ever. I mean, they just eat it up. Like, they love it. Um, and it's just, it's such an amazing thing. And, you know, Audible is fabulous. I know that um, there's a lot of things online right now. Um, I saw that Michelle and Barack Obama were reading, were doing story time, which is amazing. I want to listen to that. 
Um, you know, there's just there's everything is there's a lot of things out there right now. Just taking advantage of that and and also like to really nurture a love of reading. It's important for uh, children to see the adults they live with reading. Mm-hmm. So I just can't encourage uh, parents and caregivers and enough to 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 sit and read in front of children. Read your own book that you're interested in in mm-hmm. front of children mm-hmm. uh, because that impacts their their interest in reading, their excitement about reading. Um, and you could have them pull a book over and you guys can read your your uh, your own books side by side. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, that's a that's another way to really help encourage children to read this well, special one on one time where we're just reading together. Yeah. Our own books. Well, isn't it? Um, I can't remember who told me this. I think I was at a Montessori workshop. I don't know um, that the lap method is the most important reading tool. Basically, having a child sit on your lap and reading to them is one of the do you have you heard that yeah. before? I feel like I, I haven't I haven't heard that exact thing, but I mean, that makes sense to me. That mm-hmm. idea of, you know, mm-hmm. it's connecting, which is why, you know, we should be reading books to the very youngest of children. We should read books to babies and read books all the way through all the way through their childhood. I mean, I still love to listen to something read aloud mm-hmm, uh, even as an adult. Mm-hmm. Um, so those are some big things that can happen to support children's language development, even over the summer right now. Mm-hmm. If, if we can just have, have books in the environment, listen to books, read books, um, play you know some little language activities together, that's going to do a lot to support children uh, through the summer. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's something that I think is really, you know, that's really doable. Right. over That's really that's a that's a great um, and not necessarily a goal for the children, but it's, it's a good way to just sort of keep them excited and and to just further develop that love of learning. I mean, take a book outside or have a picnic outside and read a book outside or, you know, any of that. Um, so you can work on if you're a guide, maybe you can come up with um, some ideas for your parent community. Um, and talk, maybe just talk to your elementary students about, you know, if they're reading anything or, you know, just keep that conversation going so they can they can stay excited. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about um, writing in the elementary classroom. Um, I think that writing, you know, that preparation of the hand that they go through in primary slash their entire you know, under the age of six world. I mean, it still continues in elementary. Um, but, you know, we I don't we don't expect them to come into elementary writing fluently either. Um, their writing, I've in my personal experience, it's pretty far along the primary. Gosh, they just some of them, some of these six year olds just came in with the most gorgeous cursive handwriting, way better than mine. <laughs> it was just amazing <laughs> to me. I was like, oh, my God. Um, and I find that children really like writing as well. Um, they feel like they have ownership over it. Um, I mean, even if it's just writing their name, um, I find that that's, you know, again, it's that self-expression. Like I wrote this, like this is mine, Yeah. you know? And, and that's why we in children's house really start with writing because we, um, and we want the children to write what's in their head. You know, we Mm -hmm. want them to um, to be connecting writing to their own thoughts and self-expression. So we have to be really careful about ever giving them something to copy or mm-hmm. ever, you know, sort of requiring writing in the early stages of writing because we want them to really connect it to their own thinking. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and when they come into the elementary, yeah, it's a powerful feeling to know that you can, you know, silently communicate mm-hmm. something to someone. You can write down your thoughts and there they are. Um, and so, yeah, so we 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 take them in however they come in, wherever they are in their writing development. And, I, you know, we love to see that cursive writing 
for any number of reasons. It's more efficient. It's less hard on the, you know, exhausting on the hand. Mm -hmm. It's easier to prevent letter reversals. It's, um, you know, any number of reasons we like to do cursive. Uh, So hopefully they've come in with some cursive and we continue to support that. And, and, but, you know, not just, yes, we want them to have strong letter formation. So they're you know, writing can be read by other people, but we don't want them to only be doing handwriting practice. Like right. They should be writing whatever they want to write. And mm-hmm. we have all sorts of beautiful papers they can choose from to do that work on. It doesn't just have to be handwriting paper. Right. You know, they, <laughs> right. Can, they, they can use any, you know, any types of paper that gets them excited about um, expressing themselves mm-hmm. in writing. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, you're right. It, it's not limited to just one kind of paper. And and that might sound like a silly detail to adults, but to children, if they can pick all these different kinds of papers, that's so exciting. And also different kinds of mm-hmm. pencils, because we all know elementary children love pencils. Oh, goodness. We should do a podcast yes. about pencils. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. But yeah, I mean they don't just have to write in a graphite pencil mm-hmm. and they don't mm-hmm. you know so we we want to be sure that we're making writing exciting for them that they feel a sense of, you know, that they're getting their personalities out mm-hmm. and that we continue to encourage writing through all the years even if writing something that, you know, that the children are struggling with. I, right. I've done a number of workshops for teachers on writing. And one thing I ask is, how many of you write every day? Mm. And I wonder how many of our listeners write every day, like write from their own minds for their own pleasure. Mm. And mm-hmm. certainly, you know, it ends up being about maybe a quarter of mm-hmm. them mm-hmm. do some sort of regular journal writing. But a lot of adults do not write every day. Wow, yeah. And I can mm. and I can say as someone I do a lot of writing for my work and writing is hard. It it's is hard. so hard. I, mean, I have a I have a degree in English and mm-hmm. it's hard for me to write. I, and so we have to I encourage you if you are helping children learn to write and you yourself have not done any writing in a while, I encourage you to just sit and do some independent writing mm-hmm. and think about that process. And think about how you can support children in their writing process based on your own, you know, because sometimes it's uh, hard to get words onto the page. What a great, um, what a great point. I mean, it, writing is, it's exhausting. I mean, it's, it's creative work, right? I mean, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's coming from your brain, of course. So you have it there, but putting those words on paper Sometimes. I mean, I've had, I write for my job too, and I'm a writer and, you know, I just love to write, but I've had plenty of moments where I'm just staring at a blank page or a blank screen and I have no idea what I'm going to say. And I have it in my brain, I think, right? But it takes a lot to get those words on paper. Um, Well, and as we're helping children to write, we want them to really, we don't want them to feel like it's going to be edited immediately because that right. can make them scared to write. Yep. But then at the same time, we want to free them up to recognize that once it's on paper, that doesn't mean uh, that it's perfect and that mm-hmm. we can move it around. I mean, even to the like to this day, my husband, who edits a lot of my work, is a professional editor for a while in his career. He will often like take my very last paragraph and move it to the beginning of oh, my wow. paper or he will rearrange sentences in a paragraph like we have to feel really comfortable and confident that we can do that level of revision and we want the mm-hmm. children to experience it that that this is a first draft and wow you know this actually makes more sense up here or what if we cut you know so I I always encourage when we're helping children start you know when they're ready to start doing some drafts which mm-hmm. certainly that's not the youngest children oh yeah it takes a olds, while mm-hmm but but the older children, let's just cut your let's just cut this apart and see if we could rearrange it in mm-hmm. a different order. If you know, of course, that's a lot easier to do if we're typing it on a on a, a word document or something. But it it's just as easy to do if they've handwritten something. We just cut it cut it apart. And I think 
helping children be like self-critical and thoughtful about their Mm -hmm. writing without them feeling judged is a delicate line we have to walk. But that's that's the relationship any professional writer has with their editor. Absolutely. And that and that's the exact experience. If we're helping children to write, we're like a really good editor. And that means we have to maintain the children's voices. You know, they, we have to keep their voice in their writing, but offer them the support and guidance to, you know, to craft their piece into something that more effectively expresses themselves. And that's why we can't do it so much with the younger children who we just want them to write. Right. Just write and write and write. Mm-hmm. Even if it's a 25 page story about fairies and all you get is the description <laughs> of each fairy. Um, oh. Like, that's fine. But with the older ones, we can start to get them thinking. Their their ability for, you know, capacity for metacognition is increasing as they as they get older. And we want them to think about their own thinking and mm-hmm. how that gets expressed in writing. And we we can nurture and support them in that. Right. So when you have that relationship with them and you go in and edit and, and it feels like a safe space, that's going to serve them exactly what you're saying, like that relationship, you know, ha- having them be OK with criticism at a young age. Right. It's so important because there are a lot of adults that can't take criticism well. And, you know, criticism oh. isn't meant to be negative. It's meant to be collaborative. Like, hey, what about what do you think about this? You know, that whole creative process. I mean, that that's super valuable. Um, but yeah, you need to definitely, you know, this is where your observation comes into play or your your conversations that you've had with the children. I've had many conversations with some of my students being like, uh, are you do you, are you sure you want me to edit this? Like, you know, you know, just like making sure, because if I still feel like they might, you know, they might not be ready. I, I you know, you don't want to just pounce, you know. Um, right. Well, because- and the key is to always edit edit with them right next to you and Mm -hmm. they so that it's never something where you know you're off in a you know somewhere else and all they see is like a a marked up piece of paper so editing together is really important so they can see and you can see like oh okay I've given enough feedback like I can tell by their body language and their sort of nonverbal responses that, Mm -hmm. you know, this is um, I'm going to ignore these 10 other things I want to share with them because they're not going to be able to hear it right now. Mm -hmm. And so I think uh, editing next to them or and like having the child hold the editing pencil so you know Mm. you're gonna help read together and have the child hold it have the child see what needs to be seen or you point it out and say hey here's a here's a symbol an editing symbol I want to teach you for you know how to say this needs to be capitalized and you point that out to them or whatever Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. and I always you know tend to start with you know the simple things like um uh capitalization and punctuation yeah but then move into sort of sentence structure you know it's you can help them notice a run-on sentence if you read it out loud to them without taking a breath right and Mm -hmm. the child will say oh yeah that's I mean different little things like that but I think doing that in relationship is is the key as an adult I mean I I still struggle when I when I give a piece of writing to someone to edit and it comes back covered in marks. Oh, I yeah. still have an, mm-hmm. you know. It sucks. So I think, <laughs> so, you know, we have to be careful with six-year-olds if, mm-hmm. you know, a middle-aged woman in her 40s still struggles with that. <laughs> no, I do too, uh, you know, because, you know, your writing, it's a, it's very personal. It's, you know, it, it's literally from you that you are putting out there into the world. So that's, that's how that child feels about the report on, um, the grasslands in Africa. I don't know. Like that they have, they feel huge ownership over that. And it's just Mm -hmm. something to keep in mind. Well, and it, and then as we as we build this relationship about writing with them, we can help them feel less like personally connected to the writing. Right. We can help them mm-hmm. build more of that objectivity of like, oh yeah, I this is what I meant to say, but it's not clear here. So of mm-hmm. course I'm going to change it, and I'm mm-hmm. not going to feel you know miserable about it. Like we mm-hmm. want them to be able to recognize that their work isn't 
them completely and that while it contains a huge amount of them and that it can be draft, you know, it can go through a draft process. But that takes that takes incredible finesse and relationship with with the child. So for children at home this summer, um, I would just encourage a lot of writing and yeah. that they write. I mean, they get out and and they write about their nature walks. They mm-hmm. write about, you know, the how they've seen. Uh, I mean, I feel like I've noticed the changes in, in the season here far more than I normally do because mm-hmm. I've been home Me and too. watching outside. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. You know, they they can they can write about that kind of thing. You know, encourage them to do uh, some writing practice on a regular basis throughout the summer. Mm-hmm. And if there's interest or desire in in beginning a draft process, you could start uh, walking down that path with them. But otherwise, the fact that they're just writing on a regular basis is really going to, you know, keep that skill in place for them and when they get back um, back to school in the fall. Absolutely. Um, I know I've seen some things from my school and other schools of uh, students writing letters to one another, um, which I just thought was so great. Um, let's not let letter writing ever die because... <laughs> There's nothing better than just getting a letter in the mail, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah. My and, college-age daughter has gotten several letters from friends. I from love that. From college friends. Isn't that sweet? I love yeah. that. So that's another thing that they can do as well because um, I know they're all missing their, their, their classmates right now or maybe send some notes to family members that you can't see. You know, anything like that is, is a great, you know, that's another fun thing to help with writing. I remember growing up, my mom was such a stickler for thank you notes oh, and I just have memories of writing thank you notes like when I was really young oh man and but like I, I had to write them for all my Christmas presents or you know you name it but there's writing practice right there you know so mm-hmm. lots of options um, and I think you know at the at the root of it all it's just developing that deep love of language and literature and you know, the richness of words and helping their vocabulary. I mean, it, it will serve them for years, um, you know, and literature and reading. I mean, it's just there. There is so much there. Um, and, and children well, and love it. They naturally they I think they naturally love literature and stories. Oh, they love. Yeah, they love words in general. And I mm-hmm. think the other big thing that can um, we can support children in this summer at home is also um, is also spoken language skills. So we should mm-hmm. make sure they're witnessing um, conversations and that they're participating in conversations and and not just participating. Like you know, really treat them with the you know same respect you would treat an adult in a conversation. So ask them to justify their opinions. Mm -hmm. Ask them to explain more about their thinking about something. Uh, You know, really show them the respect you would show another adult, even if that is disagreeing with them, you know, because that sort of conversation also, not only does it build their spoken language skills, but it builds their thinking, Mm -hmm. right? If they're having to to um, justify their opinion or something Mm -hmm. else. So great, you know, conversations is another thing that can happen uh, throughout throughout the summer whenever possible. Yeah. And don't be afraid to use big words or big vocabulary with your child or with your students, because, you know, they I think they need to hear, you know, that sort of, yeah. I mean, they need to understand what you're saying, but, you know, being around, it's just like reading to them above their reading level, you know, speaking to them like an adult, you know, in a, in a, you know, sophisticated conversation, um, that, that's, that's super valuable. I remember growing up, um, whenever my parents are musicians, so they would have artists come visit, you know, you know, we'd all, we would always have people at our house gathering and my sister and I were always there talking to adults and I can I can tell you know I I, now I I mean speaking to other adults is has always been easy for me because I think I was doing it at such a young age you know and hearing those conversations and understanding how to how to speak to somebody you know Um, so that's another thing just like you know all those conversations you can have you know 
don't be afraid to to really have a a you know sophisticated conversation with your seven year old. It, it might be about yeah. peanut butter or something, but that's okay. You know, it doesn't matter what it's about. Right. Yep. Totally. I think all of these things are things that are sort of all um, woven throughout the work we do in Mm -hmm. the classroom with the children. Mm -hmm. And it's stuff that can continue and be supported like at home and throughout the summer. Um, Because, you know, it is, you know, language is such a central part of just our day to day existence. So it really is. uh, So I, I encourage parents like I know, I know everyone's worried about what this chunk of time is doing to children's um, academic development. And, and, you know, there's, there's all sorts of fears about it. And, and it's true. I mean, they're not in school every day with, with their peers. And that's, you know, that's hard. But we can, you know, we can do some things at home that is that are, that will still support children's development. And, and of course, once children get back, uh, back to school, you know, we'll, we'll, I'm, all of this will get caught up. Like, I'm not yeah. worried about that. Yeah. But these things, you know, the, the, pr- you know, promoting um, a love of reading, having books available, uh, reading with children, reading next to children, uh, having good conversations, encouraging children to talk with you, mm-hmm. uh, and having them write, having them see you write, um, and you know all of those things can support their their language development throughout throughout the rest of the summer. That's right. It's a great it's a great time to explore all of that. So just try to have fun with it, and um, yeah, all that encouragement. It'll it'll be great. It'll be a great summer of literature. <laughs> That's right. <laughs>